Good morning and welcome back to the Isle of Faces. Today is Valar Reredis slash Scraps and Scrolls. We are on part number two of Clash of Kings and it's our first full episode. Last week, intro episode with the uh, Maester Crescent prologue and then there's two other chapters. Today, we're going the full hog. We've got six chapters to look through for you. So, hello, I am Sir Buckley speaking to you from the Isle of Faces and also from a very, very rainy England. How do I know this? It is not just the power of sight, but the fact I have to go out and walk in it for two hours every day with the lovely puppy. But that is later, not right now. Right now we are talking Clash of Kings, like I say. The f not the first six chapters, but the first time we're looking at six chapters. Let me run through uh, which POVs we are looking at today. So we have Tyrion 1, Bran 1, Aya 2, Jon 1, Catelyn 1, and finally Tyrion 2. So mostly we're getting the... Uh, opening days for for Tyrion, for Bran, for Jon and for Catelyn and we get a, a second chapter for Arya and Tyrion also. So lots of uh, lots of setup, lots of reminding us what had just happened in Game of Thrones and uh, definitely a lot of theme building and letting us know what's going to be happening later on. So today not too much to say beforehand other than my usual please go and check out History of Westeros and all the, the proper live streams of Aziz and Shea and everything else they do. I'm sure you do already, but it's always a good reminder. And of course, thank you to our wonderful patrons who keep supporting this podcast. And uh, if you would like to get involved, please do. Apart from that, let's get going. So we start with Tyrion 1, perhaps better known as the one where Tyrion goes to his small council meeting and has a bit of an argument with Cersei. Basically, Tyrion takes up the handship. Now we already had a, a quick intro to Tyrion in Sansa's chapter last week where he arrives with his mountain men and has a happy time with Marcella and Tommen and not such a happy time with Joffrey but now he's getting to work and this is a big part of the book obviously Tyrion has the most chapters he's very much considered the main character of the book if you want to categorize it like that and his is a role repeated throughout the book a lot of this clash of kings is in the view of others who are considered hands in in one way or another we have davos who's looking after stannis for us catelyn is with rob for not not all of the book for a large section and definitely acts in that kind of hand role in terms of advising going off and representing rob etc etc no hand for renly unfortunately but he does die early on maybe because he needed a, a good hand by his side and Theon, he doesn't fill the role for hand for Balon, but he is kind of our Balon cam. We get an eye on all the kings. So Clash of Kings or Clash of Hands, I'll let you decide. If we remember that Tyrion's mission from Tywin to come to King's Landing in the first place is to go and sort out the small council because Tywin's sick of the misrule, basically, and Ned being beheaded and what's gone on while, he, while he's busy fighting a war. It should be kind of easy just to hold the city, but it seems not to be. So he sent Tyrion to go and sort it out. That's Tyrion's main gig. So it's fitting that that's the, the first thing we see Tyrion do, is going to a small council meeting, lining them all up, as Ned did once before, and uh, basically seeing how bad things have gotten already in Cersei's short time as top dog, or Cersei and, and Joffrey. Surprisingly, this is one of just two small council meetings we get in this book. It seems like there was way more back in Game of Thrones and you would have thought there was definitely more than two in this but I guess Tyrion he gets a lot more one-on-ones with Varys and Littlefinger and uh, and Pycelle and Cersei as well perhaps that is the way Ned should have done it but here we are so like I say King's Landing is in a, a real bad way already we discussed about Joffrey's tourney in air quotes last week where you can't already can't invite the small folk because they're already pissed it almost seems like it's a reaction to ned's death that it, as if ned's execution being so unjust and unfair has turned the place rotten not that king's landing was ever paradise of virtue in the first place but definitely we didn't get the sense in game of thrones that we do in clash of kings later with the bread riots etc etc and yeah to me it's just that offsetting everything goes wrong after ned's death and this is this is one effect so in terms of the small council meeting this chapter is pretty much a death knoll for Tyrion, highlighting what he knows about littlefinger uh kicking off everything and the war knowing about the dagger because as far as we know this is pretty much the last time he thinks of it he thinks to himself he's gonna have to have a talk with littlefinger about it nothing comes 
and that's just kind of the end of it really which is a, a bit of a shame but there we go now on to so i'm going to go move past that little introduction he has with the small council and get on to his conversation with cersei which is a bit more interesting so that meeting between brother and sister remember they've not seen each other for a long time now not since they've had one chapter near the beginning of game of thrones uh interior one game of thrones and they had what four or five lines of dialogue between them and now they're thrust together in in this really important relationship so the meeting between them is based on just two common grounds between them basically and Tyrion has to seize on them to get through to Cersei at all and they are their family members Jaime and Tywin both of Tyrion and Cersei they're vying for power with each other when they really know deep down for both of them their power either derives from or depends on Tywin so they have to kind of play by his rule book or neither of them gets to play the game at all at the same time Jamie is the one person that they both love and the only bridge that could allow them to work together. You see Cersei resisting, Tyrion trying to put him in his place, but once Tyrion brings up Jamie, she's willing to concede and actually think about, oh, I actually do need to work with Tyrion if I want Jamie back, and of course she does. So once Tyrion lies about, um, you know, running things by her and including her in the process, which she seems to swallow a bit too easily, once he's done that, it, it almost seems like Cersei has been waiting for someone she can actually talk to. She just starts pouring out information and telling Tyrion all what's happened about uh, since Eddard's death and what the original plan was with Eddard and how she's struggling with Joffrey. She, I guess she has Lancel in this book, but she probably doesn't really want to talk to Lancel all that much. So she's just pent up all this information and wants to let it out. She obviously doesn't fully trust Tyrion, but if she's going to unload, it's going to be on a member of her family. And Tyrion is the best option right now. Sorry, Lancel. It's kind of almost unfair that Cersei is the first victim of how we are shown Tyrion's political abilities. We've seen it in Game of Thrones, how he brings the clansmen, how he manipulates Lysa, etc, etc. But now we're getting it in a, in a real position of power. And Cersei is the first victim of how Tyrion runs circles around people in this book. So like we said a minute ago, a lot of these first chapters has got to be hints and foreshadowing and laying the base thematically. That's what we get with Tyrion. Tyrion's going to spend this book running political rings around everyone and Cersei is first up. And the second part of this chapter is Tyrion, after this meeting, he goes off to wherever his hidden Shay. Varys is already there, so Varys is really playing his best game to kind of show Tyrion, hey, look what I can do. And uh, certainly works because gets in Tyrion's wick a bit. And he, Varys, he discusses his famous riddle, which I won't go into as he's did enough of that on Sunday. But really, that riddle, I think we can agree, is it is this book about where power derives from, who deserves it, who do you follow, etc, etc. That is the Clash of Kings, isn't it? And um, we've already spoke last week about how big of an influence religion is in this book, and money didn't hurt either. So that's about it for Tyrion 1. Just for one further note, I think it's fitting that Tyrion, early on in this chapter, he has an interaction with Sir Mandon Moore. So again, we're setting up beginning and end arcs here, because obviously the book starts interaction with Mandon Moore, and right near the end, Tyrion has a bit more of an intimate reaction, uh, interaction with Sir Mandon Moore out on the Blackwater. Okay, so that's Tyrion 1. Let's whiz through to Bran 1, the one with the Walders and the one where <laughs> Bran just kind of howls a lot. So like I said, the big and little Walder, if you remember from Game of Thrones, they've been sent up as wards from the agreement to cross the twins for Rob. And so they finally arrived and they aren't fitting in too great. Bran doesn't like them. Can't blame him. They are knobs. But in terms of what they're actually getting up to, it's a lot of playing Lord of the Crossing, if you remember that game. I doubt I'm the only one who, during first read or even subsequent reads, found the explanation of the, this game a bit boring. And then, what, why are we learning this? But obviously on rereads, you, you realize what is being told here. And it's pretty much the story of not only the Red Wedding, but how the phrase have come to power over the, the centuries and millennia that they've controlled that bridge. And it's a real um, indoctrination, indoctrination for Frey kids that they have to learn this early on. So they know their family background, they know where their power derives from and again we're getting that that Varys riddle again even in small hints and um where the economic stability comes from and basically how to use people and take advantage of what you've got even kids they've 
this is burned into them so that all frays know the deal. And of course, like we say, it is also a very red tinted window into a future wedding. And to be fair to the Walders, Winterfell is a pretty rough place to be warded at. They've come very, very far, halfway up the continent. It's a long, dangerous journey. They've gone to a completely different climate. It's cold, winter is coming. A uh, different culture, different religion. This is nothing. It's not like being fostered at River Run, or even go. Even if you went from the Twins to, I don't know, Horn Hill, they are much more similar, obviously, than going to Winterfell. It's a completely different, different world up there, and we can already see that. We've already had the example of the effect it had on Theon. And to be fair, Theon was already in a very different place, being on Pike and a member of the Drown God, etc. But it's still the same change. It's still just as erupt a change uh, going from there to Winterfell as it is from going to the from coming from the south to Winterfell. Although from Bran and Rickon's perspective, they've seen people go south and they've want, wanted them to come back, obviously. And instead, they're getting these two annoying phrases. It's a pretty rubbish replacement. They they love people. Rob, and Catelyn and John, they've all gone. Who do they get back? Little Walder and Big Walder. Rubbish, rubbish replacement. Sticking with the Walders, they are both very anti-wolf, just like many other Freys later on in Storm of Swords, worth noting. And speaking of what happens later on, I wonder if the Freys back home at the Twins, I wonder if those Freys were annoyed at the Starks' inability to look after these two Walders, because obviously later when the castle falls, they get taken by Ramsay. Now, the party line is obviously they're safer with Ramsay and because of Roos's deal with the phrase and the, that protection. But it may have still annoyed Lord Walder Frey and the phrase in general that the Starks didn't protect them. They, they obviously didn't know they were going to be saved by Ramsay or at least join up with Ramsay. So their weakness in protecting their kin is another kind of breaking in the agreement. Obviously, Rob breaks it majorly with the wedding to Jane Westerling, but they've also failed in their duty to protect Little and Big Walder. And I'm sure that is not big enough of a reason to slaughter everyone, but it might have played in their minds a little bit. Moving on to Bran himself. Bran, he wants to go and help Rob in his campaign, much like John does uh, in a second. And it's, that just goes to show because John, obviously, he is good of a sword and more than capable of going and helping Rob, Bran, not so much, unfortunately. But it goes to show that it's not a matter of, while well, I'm big and strong and can use a sword, it's not about ability or usefulness or even your age. It's just about wanting to purely help and protect a family member. John wants to go and protect Rob and help Rob. Bran, he feels the exact same way, and it's that family connection coming through. And both of them, both Bran and John, for different reasons, can't. And it's it really gnaws at them and drives at them that feeling of powerlessness that Catelyn feels a lot of the time and she is with Rob so they're all pretty much in the same boat. I think Bran being the only one to not mind the constant howling of the wolves is pretty telling of con his connection and where his story is going to go and speaking of howling Bran he, <laughs> he howls in poor Maester Lewin's face. Poor Maester Lewin. But it does make me wonder how how many of Blood Raven's failed past apprentices if we agree that he's done this with several children over the years and decades or however long how many of them did something similar to their maesters and were started acting weird and had this kind of thing happen and how many maesters therefore just wrote them off and said yeah they're mentally ill let's stick them in a room and whatever the westerosi do if they're mentally ill probably nothing nice i wonder how lucky bran is that he's in a loving um setting still and isn't just cast off as like this kid's howling at me we need to just get rid of him and consider that also that lewin he is the um he studied the higher mysteries and even this is too much jimmy uh, he just has to walk away not only frustration is part of it but also i'm sure pity he's he knows what brand's going through and he's obviously very close to brand he's a parent figure and that's going to be really explored during this book even more than game of thrones and he's got to go. He's just got to watch him go through this really hard time because, what, what else can he do? Really, there's only so much a maester can do. So really rough on Lewin, but um, luckily he at least uses his final months and especially his final acts to help Bran as much as possible. Okay, let's take a break from opening chapters and get onto our first 
recurring. This is Aya 2, the one the one where we're, we're still on the road, but now we are meeting uh, Jacques and Hagar and Baita and Rorge. And most importantly, there is Nymeria talk in this chapter, which is the very best kind of talk that there is. Uh, I think as he's got to my notes on uh, Nymeria, so I'll skip past that. Let's move on to Jacques and Hagar instead who I find pretty comparable to Melisandre. He's another introduction to to magic being used within the world. He has another religion coming up. Now that, his religion and the many-faced god, I don't think that's spoken about really in this chapter, but it will come up later. And like we said last week, there are three introductions, three new religions coming into this book. So it's a lot to take on. But he is um, just kind of the evidence of more magic eerie stuff has come back to the world and again we don't get that in this chapter but we we know what's coming also he's got red hair as does melisandre as does egret later on there's a there's a theme going on here that george is not that we're not realizing george is liking his redheads in the clash of kings now obviously Jon snow is Arya's best connection to the night's watch being a good place and being noble and worthwhile and also she's grown up in Winterfell. She's got an uncle that serves and Ned is definitely, a, or was definitely a, a friend to the Night's Watch. So I has grown up with a healthy respect of it. But also this time with Yorin, it really shores up her thoughts of how people from the Night's Watch can be good. And I'm sure later on in Feast of Crows, Aya is thinking about Yorin just as much as she's, as she's thinking about Jon Snow and Uncle Benjen when she comes across Sam and obviously Darion in Bravos, but that is much later let's talk about Yorin a little bit poor Yorin, he's refusing to admit that this fight is one too big for the night's watch the night's watch's neutral neutrality to matter he's being a bit bullheaded just like gendry whenever he wears his helmet uh, about getting through on along the king's road because he, he's a man of habit and he generally does believe in this neutrality he's been doing this for years he's never had any problems so why should he now we're going to get through this don't worry about it it's not that big of a deal so you wonder is he putting on a brave face for the people around him does he just generally not want to admit to himself that how bad this war is and that they're actually in a spot of bother and we're going to come back to this next week in io3 because we, we see the after effects of his decisions but really it is just your own doubling down on what he knows as many of the older characters do kind of unwilling to change Having said that, what other options does Yoren really have anyway? Certainly have a hard time recruiting any of the fleeing small folk to turn around and aid him or come with him. They they could have got to a boat, but there's a, that's a lot of people and supplies to pay for, and he's he's just so full into this institutional law about the watch. He's he's ready to kill or die for it anyway. So I don't nothing's changing his mind really. Now at the end of this chapter, the gold cloaks arrive and start talking about we're looking for this and that and um the girl and the boy and whatever else and Yorin, like we just said he's bullheaded he's uh, no chance get out of here in fact uh one of the better lines is uh that man said he'd take your head too well as to that Yorin said if he can get it if he can get it off my shoulders he's welcome to it and we can stop the podcast there let's stop the reread it's the best line easily it's definitely one of the better ones but the point is that Yorin is saying no he's saying don't care who you're looking for, even if they are here, which I'm not saying they are, they're a member of the Night's Watch now, so they're nothing to do with you. But that does lead me to questions about these intricacies of Night's Watch lore. So is Gendry, as someone who said he's going to go up north and take the black, is he already exempt from his crimes? Obviously we know he doesn't actually have any crimes, but is he still exempt? Is he already under the protection? Because he hasn't taken the vows or actually even arrived at the wall. So can can any man anywhere quickly shout that he'll take the back and then be exempt? Or is it up to someone? Does someone have to decide? If someone's just murdered someone in the middle of a village and he runs away and then uh, he's still on the top of a waterfall fugitive style with Tommy Lee Jones looking at him, can he just shout, no, no, I'm going to take the black? And then they have to do it? Is someone, does someone get to decide? Not sure. Not sure what happens there. Just another question. I wonder what, what would happen if Tyrion had said that after killing Tywin? Do you think they would have let him do that? Surely it is up to someone, but yeah, just something to think about. Uh, also, when these gold cloaks come out, uh, when these gold cloaks rock up, there's some instant camaraderie amongst the potential Black Brothers. 
Likely, this is because it's the first group any of them have ever belonged to, and to be fair, they they might be looking forward to going to the wall. If they they've lived the rough life on the streets, they're seeing what's happening in the south. Um, perhaps these prisoners are actually looking around, going, "The wall might be the best place for us." They're probably going to like it a, mo a lot more than John did when he first arrived. Okay, they're not going to be as used to the cold, true. But most of these people have never had a, a proper bed or a regular meal in their whole life, or even proper clothes. So they might be thinking, oh, I'm not letting these gold cloaks mess this up. They would have, again, they would have seen the gold cloaks probably abusing their powers and being knobs their whole lives. They don't represent anything good to them. They're just a reminder of the whole city they just go out of. So they say, no, you're not messing this up. We're going north. We're going to do it together. Just a few more notes on Aya from this chapter. She, she's even getting attached to the bugs in her clothes because she sees, sees them as all she has. And tragically, she already says that she's tired of running. And, and we know, obviously, that this is just the beginning. She's really not even started. Her running yet. So that's a bit sad. <sighs> let's go back to her first opening chapter. Let's move on to John 1. The one in the library, and the one where they leave the wall. It's actually really surprising to me that we, considering what a staple of the a Song of Ice and Fire world the wall is, and how much time we spend there, and just how dominating it is, it's never occurred to me before that we actually just get this one chapter at the wall, and that's it for the whole book. That's really it. And just considering how much time we spend there in Game of Thrones and, and Storm of Swords, obviously not Feast of Crows, but Dance of Dragons, this is weird to me, it didn't even occur to me before. But there you go. I think uh, Aziz went through my <laughs> list of library openings, so I won't repeat that, but that was fun to think about. But just for t touch on the library, considering its size and their age, We've got to think there's some completely unknown material in there and the amount of stuff they could find out if they really got to have a look. Sam does find some useful stuff later, but thinking about... The, they say there's stuff about records of the language of the children. That's probably going to be handy for Bran or other people. Get that out. Copy that one up. And hopefully someone gets the chance before it that it probably burns as well. I think there's going to be lots of burning of libraries because George is one sick little man. But the bigger part of this chapter, once Sam comes out of his little reedy hole back up to daylight, we have finally arrived at the Great Ranging slash the Great Blunder. We spoke a lot about this again in Game of Thrones, about how personally I think this is a pretty bad idea of Geo's to take 200 men and eventually 300, a third of their entire number and all the fighting men up above the wall. So I won't go over that too much because you've heard me rant anyway but i don't know not that long ago john mormon he was talking about how much the night's watch have forgotten and all the stuff they need to do and his reaction is just to strap on the sword get everyone on the swords on the horses instead of maybe i don't know checking out that big library sam's just been in maybe you should just do that first you know what the true threat is you've just been attacked by one of them yes the wildlings and massings yes you want to know what's happened to benjamin but maybe just check out the library first before you all go blindly wandering into the snow. Alas, that's not going to happen. We learn in this chapter that Foreign Smallwood, he offers to lead the ranging in place of Jill. This might have been a better idea, actually. Send out a smaller force, a hundred men, to find out, firstly, that Mance is coming down and all these villages have been abandoned, as we'll talk about in John's next chapter in the next week. Okay, the original idea is to find Benjin, but that slips away pretty quickly. The smaller force, they might have been able to move a bit quicker and find out some more. While Gior does the important job of retaining command on the wall. That's not the glamorous job. That's not as great as going out and riding off, saving your old buddy and defeating Mance Raid on the way. No. And we know, we've said about Gior before, he wants some glory. He wants some point to his Night's Watch stint. But he also says we should have remembered and done what's important. And staying at the wall preparing it for the eventual coming of the others that's the important stuff and that's the kind of thing that john realizes later in his own time as law commander that it's not the glamorous sword waving it's the nitty-gritty but having said that if foreign smallwood does lead out a smaller force 
the fist, it probably still happens the same way, but at least less people die, less people for the um, for the others to take into their army. And maybe if Dior does stay, puts all that effort into prepping the wall, they're a bit better set up for when Mance comes and when John eventually comes back. Geo is probably a lot more pliable than Alice Fawn and Janos Slint. Last note on Geo, I'm not sure why he is calling, he refers to Sam as a fool. I'm not really sure why. Sam was dead on about the corpses of J4 Flowers in 04, and he's just found you a bunch of handy maps. So maybe just say thanks, Geo, and shut the hell up. Moving on to John in this chapter. We don't actually get that much of John really in this chapter, it's more about what's going on. But he is, um, he's still loyal after the news of Rob's crowning, but understandably, he's a little bit jealous under the surface. They were never on equal footing uh, when they were growing up, even though they were very, very similar in age and height and ability, etc. But John always knew Rob was going to have a, a foot up because of his birth. But now that's a lot more pronounced because one is a king and one is about to <laughs> march through freezing forests for months on end, as, as G.R. Point, points out. And we get that really good interaction with Donald Noy laying out the different qualities of kings. And hey, if that's not what the book's about, what is? So again, good thematic setting up early on. John, he also talks about his feelings on Molestown. Uh, a lot of the other Black Brothers are going off for one more night of uh, revels before they have to go above the wall. John says, no, no, thank you. I've got O's. I'm not all about that. And I think that's important that he's setting that up because... Like we just said with Tyrion talking to Mandon before the ending with Mandon, John is talking about not breaking his oaths of women and later on at the end of this book he will meet Egret. So that's more setting up from George. Final note on this chapter, Alice of Fawn is gone, he's been sent south. So now Sir Andrew Tarth is taking his role and training the new recruits. And I'm just annoyed we've now found out who that is. Is that Brienne's uncle? Brienne's cousin someone to do with brienne surely i need to know i want to know i want the tarf family tree please george before anything else before wins just publish that i'll be happy but enough dilly dallying about these other characters let's get on to catelyn yes we know hopefully you all know my love for catelyn it's a pov so let's talk about her first chapter in this book so this is the one where the at river run and cleos Frey gets sent to king's landing and theon gets sent to Pike and eventually Catelyn will be sent south or a little bit after this chapter but the idea crops up. I find it much easier to separate the Catelyn chapters in my mind when I think about Clash than, than the other POVs. She's got real clear okay this happens in that chapter and then this happens in that chapter. She meets Renly. Next chapter it's Renly and Stannis. Next chapter Renly dies they're on the run blah 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 etc etc whereas a lot of the other povs in this book i think they can blend together a bit i as especially i as early chapters uh, amongst the uh, black brothers and heading to harren hall if you say to me i have four i'd have to look up what happens in i4 because they'll blend together uh, it's similarly easy to mix up Tyrion and Sansa's chapters because they stay in the same place and it's a lot of uh, not the same stuff going on but Tyrion's got a lot of chapters first off and a lot of them are similar because he's running King's Landing, so it's easily uh, easy to forget which one's which. Whereas Catelyn, she has clear points in each chapter, especially early on while she's travelling. Now, in this chapter, Catelyn, she pretty much runs the gauntlet in terms of her political ideas about Balon and Rickard Karstark, and she's she's just very aware, very astute. And we talked about this before when she decided to come with Rob, how lucky rob was because catelyn knows her stuff she's not 100 percent. she does make some mistakes like sending uh, one of the manisters to pike i think that was her suggestion probably not a good idea but since uh, i think that particular manister killed one of uh bayon greyjoy's sons in the rebellion so maybe a miss there but generally she is proving her value to rob again as the political thinker and also showing just how aware she is a lot of the lords a lot of the men here they are thinking war, 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 tactics, 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 strategy. Whereas Catelyn is actually looking around and seeing about how people feel about certain decisions and really thinking about the implications of such. Let's talk about Rob quickly because even if his motives are personal when he's offering these terms, and even if they're, they're obviously not very good terms, but that is how you uh, do the negotiating, just go in with the 
really good offer. You've got to bargain a bit. And even if Rob is doing that because it's, it's obviously going to help him, he is still the only king actually looking for peace at this point. So we, we should give him credit for that. And he's got a lot of juggling to do. He's got to manage his river lords. He's got to manage his northern lords. And they, I'm surprised they don't actually come to blows in this book because they do want quite different things and they're kind of at, at odds at certain times. He's got to be aware that certain lords, they don't get all that much from this particular peace offer he's making, or at, at least they don't get all the, the juicy extras that come with conquest. They do get what they signed up to achieve, but by now they unofficially they want some kickbacks because you know, they've come down to war and they've had people die. They've had sons die, hint, hint. So peace is not in everyone's scope for what they consider a victory. But searching for a peace is Rob separating himself from Renly and Stannis. And obviously Joffrey and Balon as well. Rob isn't here to conquer all of Westeros. He just wants the homes of his family. He wants to just be separate and rule himself. So it's very different. He's not got that... He's ambitious, sure, because he wants to be king of his own state, but he's not what Renly and Stannis and the others are. At the same time, he does need to keep these declarations to keep the Northerners, Northerners on side. He can't just give away everything. They've just crowned him. He's very aware of that. He's got to be doing some. He's got to be seen doing something with that power now that the possibility of Ned is gone. They need a new goal, so he's got to kind of lay out. Okay. We can't save Ned anymore, so we're going to do this instead, and that and that, and you're going to get this, so please keep on supporting me. And like I said, when, when these um, terms are being read out, Catelyn is very astute and aware, and she sees Rickard Karstark's reaction. She's also well aware that the Lannisters are also not going to enjoy these terms. But then Rob knows that as well. And like I said, the, the River Lords and Northern Lords, I'm surprised they don't come to blows, because at this point the River Lords have gone home, so to protect their people, in fairness. But the Northern Lords are kind of just waiting there and think, well, how, how do they, why do they get to go home and have a rest? And obviously they're not actually going home to have a rest, but that's what they'll be thinking. I'm, I'm out here, we're still ready to go to war. Why are things not equal? So it's a real balancing act, even though River Run is a peaceful place for the most part in this book, it's a safe place. And even though we've just come off the big victories of Game of Thrones, this chapter is showing us that everything is not so bright and dandy and Rob does actually have some major challenges. A lot of this early on, uh, first act, it's about setting up what situations each king is in and this one is telling us that Rob isn't as well off as we might have thought at the end of Game of Thrones. Speaking of these river lords going home, so we're hit with some pretty hard questions early on in this book and this is a good, a good example. Because Brynden, the Blackfish, he tells Catelyn that Edmure, allow, Edmure and Rob allowing the River Lords to go home. That is actually the exact reason that the Lannisters have been able to get a toehold back into the, the Riverlands, back into the country. Because they're not as a united force now. So now Tywin can play a bit of separate and conquer. They've gone on their own. Tywin's still got a lot of numbers so they can rush them and cause casualties, etc, etc. What was the right decision there? Should the lords have been allowed to go back and defend the small folk on paper that's the right decision isn't it that's what they're supposed to do so Edmure he's been good for saying to his king please let my lords go home and defend their people the lords have been good for wanting to go home and defend their people and Rob has been good by allowing this all to happen and yet this is what is allowing the Lannisters back in it's what's evening the it's what's evening things out and allowing the war to continue so is it the right decision Believe me, I'm not, I'm not here trying to provide you an answer, but this, these are the questions that George is asking us about war and about the difficulties that Rob, who is still so young, is facing. And Edmure, he gets blasted for, for doing this, but again, he's looking out for the small focus, what a good lord is supposed to do, so let's lay off Edmure a little bit. Speaking of Blackfish and what, what he says, it's interesting that he refers to Beric Dondarrion as, as a sovereign lordling. Now, to be fair, the Stormlands are, the Stormlands are pretty south, far south of River Run. But I'm just wondering if they all act this way the further they go, because like obviously they're still in the south together with River Run and Storm's End. But do you have like do the Tarleys refer to the Red Wines as sovereign because the Arbor is more southerly than Horn Hill? I'm just wondering what the cutoff point is. Let's get back to let's talk about Hoster a little bit. He's obviously not an active character in this chapter or the book really, but they do mention him here because they've been kind enough to they've been kind enough to allow Brynden time to come home and see his brother and, and reconcile and I think Hoster is placed here as as old and dying to remind us of Rob's mortality no matter his current glory 
Catelyn, she remembers Catelyn and Brynden. They both remember Hoster as young and dynamic and powerful, but now he's old and grey and dying, as Rob, well, <laughs> as he would have been one day if not if things hadn't gone real bad. Now the potential for all the Southern forces to unite against Tywin. There's a bit of talk here about how Catelyn thinks if we can team up with Stannis, if we can team up with Renly. Obviously, Rob is thinking if he can get Balon on side. It reminds me a lot of the basis for Sovereign ambitions. Everyone is sick of Tywin as they once with Ares, the Mad King. So let's unionize. Let's all get together and just take him down if we don't like him anymore. Robert's Rebellion it had similar events of, of teaming up and it was a possibility here. But the politics and the chance for glory, or rather the ambition for glory, just don't allow the stars to align, really. Which is, is a shame because they really could have crushed Tywin if they had worked together. But again, the lure of the crown and the lure of Varys' riddle does not let them... And do that, and it's a bit of the um, bit of the can't let one family get ahead type stuff that was more more an issue before the Targaryens came because they obviously got very far ahead compared to everyone else. In the earlier times, a lot of the whole deal of the politics of Southern Westeros was not letting one family get ahead because then the whole thing collapsed. And the Lannisters, they have got too far ahead. They control the Westerlands. They control. King's Landing and they're trying to basically control everything else so I, I see this as a, as a reaction of the other the other kingdoms ganging up on them but obviously it does not come to be. Now we need to talk about Theon and Rob's decision to send him off. Almost all the decisions in A Song of Ice and Fire and Rob's especially can be argued one way or the other. This one is a lot harder to defend. This is the beginning of a spiraling effect that has this devastating effect obviously on many many people and but it is it was a bad idea to begin with and to be fair we can say okay ham rob didn't know that fion was going to betray him and this would happen that would happen he didn't couldn't see the butterfly effect of this but it's still a bad idea i think even in the first place rob should have known what kind of man balon was he should have done his research a bit on the religion of the drowned god and paying the iron price etc known that giving him a crown was never going to work and also he maybe should have considered the fact that he has left the North vulnerable and Balon has got a grudge against House Stark because he defeated him nine years ago and took his son away. So even if he doesn't care for that particular son anymore, that's not the point. Fiona's is treated like a commodity here. You can't just steal what is mine. I don't care if your dad did it or you did it, your House Stark. And there's an opportunity there. So Rob should have been made aware of that. Now we know um, from later reading on Fionn's chapters that Balon, he was going to attack the north anyway, so Rob wasn't going to stop that. But he did hand in Fion, and Fion took Winterfell, and then with Bran and Rickon, fake dying, again, the knock on, so we won't go all the way through, we'll be here all day. I do wonder if Rob doesn't send Fion, does he then have to behead him when Balon inevitably invades the north? I just can't see Rob doing it personally, I really can't. Maybe he imprisons him, chucks him in a cell, whatever, but I do not see rob beheading fion at all if, if he's not left him and that again that will present problems with his northern lords it'll be the same thing you're they'll be saying hey someone is invading our homes here and you've got uh, his own ward you're not going to do anything we you weren't even there rob we went down to to the iron islands we won fion as a prize that was he was our gift for winning that war our award and you're not even using him so rob would be put under immense pressure there and it would be a very similar thing to when Jamie is let go, that would have been really interesting to see because I, I just can't see Rob beheading Fionn at all. Maybe Catelyn would have let Fionn go instead, I don't, I don't know. Now, the, the real problem is that Rob had no one on his staff that could turn Balon around to the idea. That's the flaw. No one, anywhere in the world, has anyone on staff that could have turned Balon around because Balon's a moron. And again, we, he wasn't to know that Fionn would turn around and sack Winterfell, but if we want to do a real quick rundown of what would have happened or what wouldn't have happened if Fionn doesn't take Winterfell the Boltons they can never come to such power Bran and Rickon aren't reported as dead Jamie probably isn't freed Rob doesn't go into the arms of Jane Westling for comfort and Rob therefore doesn't need to go north and have to attend the Red Wedding so there's just a lot of I mean it's impossible this, this story is too complex to figure out all the different tendrils that would have been shortened or cut off if Fionn hadn't gone north and again we can say Rob didn't have much of a better choice but it's really just that handing over of Theon and not knowing what what Balon's reaction was going to be or just not not even knowing but just taking the precaution because it's too big of a risk 
And also, Rob already has this plan in place to and take on the Westerlands and make Tywin come back, etc. And that works pretty well. Lannisport being attacked by the Greyjoys, of course that would have really helped, but it's not imperative and probably not worth enough of giving your one chip against the Iron Islands away, even if that chip is actually worthless, because again, Balon's weird, but he's not to know that. <sighs> Still, Catelyn Chapter, my favourite POV. Let's move on to our last chapter today. It's going to be a short one. It is Tyrion 2, so our second returning, and um, it's Tyrion's meeting with Janos Slint. And to be honest, Aziz got through most of my notes about this, so we can do this very quickly. So firstly, in this uh, little dinner they're having, Tyrion's going through basically what happened the day of Ned's death, that specific moment of before when we saw it from Arya's POV, we could look at the reactions of everyone, of Varys flapping his arms and running and Cersei looking very distressed, obviously Sansa and Littlefinger just doing nothing. We've discussed that already. But we can combine that rundown now with what Tyrion is finding out here and we can deduce who is responsible and who's played a part like we've already done before and as Tyrion figures out. Now later on Tyrion talks to Varys and they go over Varys's riddle and his talk of little men, little men, making large shadows, it make, it's to me makes it seem like he is all but forcing Tyrion to really sit and think about Peter Baelish little finger but unfortunately not much comes out of that. Now I'm going to read you a quote here, it's from Bronn, and it says, I'd ask how much. And this is in response to Tyrion thinking about um, Alardim killing the, the baby at the, um, at the brothel in Game of Thrones, and Tyrion needs Bronn, so he declines to think too closely on how dark this statement actually is. After all, he he's just ordered that Alardim be killed on the way to the wall. He's to sentence a man to death for this crime that Bronn is saying he would also do for the right amount of money. But Tyrion's not going to think about that because he needs Bronn. He can't afford to think about Bronn like that in the same way that he refuses to think about Shay too deeply because he's not going to like the answers because he's not going to like how closely that brings him to Tysha. So he's just doing a really good job of just ignoring things that are going to upset him, which obviously that's going to come back and bite him later in Storm. And one more quote. It says, Yet shadows can kill. Oh, George, you and your blade pre-mapping of exactly what is going to happen in this book. We know what shadows are going to kill later on. But that is for another day. So that is your six chapters of today. That's part two of Valor Redis slash Scraps and Scrolls for Clash of Kings. I think it's 12 parts overall, if I'm remembering correctly. I might have to be corrected on that. But yeah, there you go. That is today all wrapped up and done. Hope you enjoyed, guys. We'll be back next week with another six chapters. Uh, I won't read who they are off the top of my head, but uh, you'll find out, I'm sure. And of course, be sure to be looking at Aziz and the Shares live streams and everything else going on at History of Westeros also. And as always, come and say hello. Drop us a message, whether you want to look at Patreon or not. We'd love to hear from you anyway. All the best, guys. 